All right. My name is Rich Schmidt. We're here with Elizabeth Tomasino. It's June 2nd, 2023. We're at Oregon State University in Corvallis. Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, the first question we ask is, why wine? Actually, it wasn't originally always wine. I knew from um, an early age I wanted to do science. I was very fortunate. My mother was a science professor, I say professor teacher, she started in college and then high school. And I was taken to a lot of opportunities for women in science to, to see a lot of things. So I always really liked science, knew I wanted to do that. I think I went through the very traditional marine biology phase that I feel like everyone goes through <laughs> at some point in time. There was a forensic science phase. Um, I'm sure a couple others. Um, and I remember going to undergrad, um, not knowing what I wanted to do. I think somewhere in my first year figuring out I want to do food science. The university I was at did not have a food science program. Um, so I contacted, I think someone from Cornell actually got back to me and said, just get a biochemistry chemistry degree and then go to grad school. So wine still has not come into the picture yet. So I got my, I got my biochemistry degree and I had an opportunity to go to Italy. I feel like I did a study abroad for the summer, like I was there for a chunk of time. And you experienced a lot of different things. In my family, we drank wine like we were allowed to taste when we were kids um, for it, but um, it isn't to the extent that I do wine, and now my family does wine because of what I do for that. And I remember going, um, two things, I remember going to Italy, and then I had also known quite a few people who were coming back to school later on in life, because they wanted to, they didn't like what they, where they were, so they were changing everything. And I remember thinking, before I go to grad school, I have to figure out what I want to do, because I don't want to come back 20 years later because I didn't like that. Um, and in looking at food science, I found wine was part of it. And I had spent that time in, in Italy. And I also had looked at all these people who were working in enology or wine. Um, it was sort of the first generation was going to be coming very close to retiring mm -hmm. as I was going to be making my way in the world from this. Um, so I applied to Cornell um, and a few other places, actually. I ended up going to Cornell for my master's and was accepted into their enology lab with Thomas Hennig Kling, who is, of course, now at Washington State University. And that's where I started with wine, and I got, I got hooked. It's a lot of different types of science. Because I remember the one thing about forensic science that turned me off was I was told, you have to get your doctorate and you spend 11 months looking in a microscope. And I have a slightly dominant eye <laughs> using a microscope. And I just went, that's not gonna work <laughs> for it. So, so I actually did a bit of microbiology and winemaking in my master's um, and really got exposed to, to a lot of different things in upstate New York. I had a, I had a good experience with that at Cornell um, for it. Learned I didn't want to do anything with spoilage. Um, if I didn't have to. I grew Britannomyces. We looked at Britannomyces, which I hate the smell of bread wines in response to that as well um, for it. So that started wine. And, and from there, I was, I was off. I did a couple of internships because I knew I wanted to get a doctorate. But I remember they were interviewing for um, what is now Gavin Sachs' position there. And we had a couple people come in. And one person was, who was interviewing had never made wine. And I remember thinking, how can you teach someone if you've never made wine? So I was like, I want a little break from school. And I went out and did um, three different internships in different positions. I started at Gallo and did their research winery internship. Um, I had the opportunity to go to Australia where I did an internship at Yalumba Winery outside of Adelaide in the Barossa Valley. And I was measuring and tracking a lot of their um, anthocyanins because part of contracts is based off color there. And they exposed me to a lot of other things. That was really interesting because like, I remember being told, hey, they've got all the library wines out. Just You should go taste them. Um, and they were very sort of, do you want to learn about this? Gallo did that as well, actually. We were allowed to go to all different types of their facilities. So it wasn't sort of just your manning a press for the rest of your life in that internship. Um, so both of those were fantastic from, a, you know, see other things for it. Um, and then I came back to the U.S., and did a harvest enology position with Robert Mandava Winery. And that was actually more of a field position because it was going out and making some decisions about when grapes were ready to get picked, which was very different from what I'd ever done before and really cemented this 
grape quality in the vineyard if you have to get this in the in the winery. And I actually remember that was fairly funny because the first week they gave me a hard time for a report I'd sent in and I literally turned around and went, no one told me what I'm supposed to be doing. So like I did the best that I could. And I remember the head winemaker, I don't know if it's the same one now, and she just went, fair point, I'll take you out tomorrow. <laughs> and I was, and that was the first time I sort of stood up my, for myself where it's like, this is not my fault. Like you gave me no information whatsoever. After that experience, <laughs> they worked out, I knew what I was doing. And, and, um, did actually a couple of different things for Mandavi, but I realized at that point in time, I didn't want to be a winemaker. Cause I was that point, it was like, you could keep making wine and eventually look for a position or I could go back to school. Um, and at that point, I think I finally told my mother, like I was like, mom, it's wine. And I'm probably only ever going to be as close as the West coast. Cause I'm originally from Boston. Cause she kept making these noises about coming back. It's like, no, I'm probably closest you're going to get is the West coast at this point in time. And then I went and got my doctorate. Um, I had a really great opportunity. Um, I actually teased James, o James Osborne here because he was, I think, a year or two new professor here at Oregon State University, and I contacted him, and he did not accept me as a student. I don't think he had funding at the time, but I look at him, it's like, you rejected me. Uh, but no, I had a really great opportunity in New Zealand. Um, they have these industry partnering grants from the Ministry of Science. It might be called the Ministry of Science and Innovation now. They keep changing the name for it. Uh, but we've got a, we got a grant that I was fully paid for for me to go do a doctorate in New Zealand <coughs> where I started my journey in Pinot Noir because it was with um, the industry partner was Pernod Ricard New Zealand. Um, then it was called Brancott Montana Winery, but has since changed to Brancott Estate because people got confused with the state of Montana and the name. And I would spend, if I remember correctly, four or five months up at the winery doing part of the research project and then back down in Christchurch um, again. And I, I started my journey. It was all about Pinot Noir terroir. And I got to do, it was really about the flavor chemistry. I wanted to do flavor chemistry. Uh, but there was a sensory component too. And apparently this is where I find it funny because saying the story about, you know, telling the people at Mandavi, no one told me. Um, I had the main winemakers in Marlboro come in and frequently they wouldn't show up. So I'd be doing phone calls or, you know, I was right in this winery area and I'd just walk over and be like, you're late, are you coming? And someone's like, that's the head of all New Zealand winemaking. And I'm like, yes, and he signed up for a slot and he didn't show up. <laughs> like, this they said they would do it <laughs> for that. But it was a great experience. I still actually keep in touch with um, quite a lot of people from New Zealand um, for it. I had a very, very great experience that, um, not that my others weren't, but in particular, um, my advisor, uh, Roland Harrison and Andy F Frost, who's no longer at Brancott Estate, they've retired at this point in time. Um, they were really instrumental in, in building me as a scientist and, and other aspects for that. And then I started applying everywhere <laughs> for a position. And I had a, my policy was give it a go if it had wine. Like I wasn't gonna be too picky. I was really interested in industry, really interested in industry actually. Um, and I remember the OSU position, I wasn't really interested in academia. And my professor came in, it was the last day you could apply. And he's like, remember your policy? And I was like, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> so I applied for it. Um, yeah, and I, the reason I say this, because I almost veered from wine at that point in time. I had, I had been offered a position um, with a big brewing company to do flavor chemistry and sensory, um, but, but ended up making the decision I wanted to stay in wine. I had a lot of contacts in wine. I just specialized in Pinot Noir. Um, the position here was a little more sensory than I had done, but they still let me do flavor chemistry, and I'm still here. What, we're on 10th, 11th year? I don't even know at this point in time. But yeah, it was from that going to Italy and knowing food science. And then once I knew food science, what did I want to do there? And, and a, lot of, a lot of stars aligned for a couple of things for that. Uh, but there were great people along the way. I learned a lot. Even some of those not great experiences, I learned a lot from them um, for it. But yeah, particularly my time in New Zealand, that was a, I had a really great doctor. I mean, it was a lot of work, but the people I worked with were phenomenal. But New Zealand, unfortunately, is far away from everywhere. Because um, I remember a few people were like, does Elizabeth know there's this position at Auckland? And it was just like 10 hour plane ride from home, people. Like I'm not doing any more of these 24, 28 plane rides. Because I had a family emergency. I had to fly home once for something. And I was like, I love New Zealand. I would go back to New Zealand, but it is far away from everywhere. Um, so yeah. And then 
ended up at Oregon State and still doing wine, like 90% wine. We've got a few other things now that are, let's just say the skill set is similar to wine, but we're doing a little coffee. I've certainly learned a lot about coffee in the past year or two. That's quite fun. So, yeah. But yeah, I was quite specific about my science career path and, and I'm happy to say I'm not planning on going back to school to change careers at any point in time. <laughs> Goal achieved. Yes. <laughs> so I want to back up for a second before we pick back up there. Mm -hmm. and you mentioned um, kind of growing up in a, a science minded. So yep. tell us about where, where you're born and raised and uh, life before college. Sure. Um, Looking back now, particularly in my 40s, I think the past few years, I've actually said thank you to my parents quite a bit because I realize now that I've had quite a few opportunities. I didn't. Um, I, my whole family's from around Long Island, New York. Um, and I should remember this. I'm not that old. Born in New Haven, Connecticut, and I feel like five or six, we moved up to Massachusetts, um, north of Boston. I grew up in North Andover. And we were there until... I mean, until I essentially left. I think my parents finally, they got tired of the snow um, and they sort of turned a little bit into snowbirds. And, and my brother and I, so I have a twin brother, um, we weren't around to shovel snow anymore. And I remember calling my father one year and it was like every two or three days there was a significant snowfall. And I just literally remember one year he's like, that's it, I'm done. <laughs> for it. He was like, your brother's not here. You're not here. Like, what are we staying in this weather for that? Um, we also bought, we, he bought, they bought the house when it was brand new versus, you know, 30 odd years later now. So that was a smart financial decision right there for it. But yeah, grew up, grew up there very, my parents greatly, greatly um, stressed the importance of education. We were really lucky with that. Um, I remember being in middle school and our high school had lost its accreditation. I don't remember what. And they were doing stuff where they didn't have enough space. So there was like, oh, we're putting partitions in the in the hallway. And I very much remember being at this like meeting for, oh, your kids are going up to high school. And and my mom was my mom was there um, with us and other people were asking some of these questions. And I remember the thing that I think set my mom off was um, they didn't want people to take too many higher or advanced place classes because they didn't want it to. And she was just like, this is ridiculous. And I don't know what conversation they had, but we ended up um, going to private school for that. And I do consider myself very lucky for that. It was like my father sent us to eight years of college for it, um, but it also greatly prepared us for college. So I went to, um, I think now it's called the Governor's Academy, but then it was Governor Dummer Academy um, for it, um, outside of Newburyport for it. And we had, looking back, it prepared us to be successful in so many ways for that. I know there's a lot of students you see coming from high school to, to college and it's like they never go to class for anything or you know their first bout of freedom you know with you're responsible for getting yourself to do that and we had already been trained like there were the expectations of, of this. Um, we knew how to get our work done to organize ourselves. A lot of that came from going having that opportunity in that school. Um, there are great public schools out there but at the time where we were growing up it had I think it has definitely since gotten its accreditation and like it's been re like you know um, renovated and things for it um, but I remember looking back being th and thinking like yeah we really were fortunate that we had that because then we did do both my brother and I did do very well in undergraduate where I feel a lot of people do sometimes struggle that first semester or first year um, for it there was also a I remember there were certain things. There was also a, a precedent of like, I remember we weren't allowed to watch a lot of TV or anything or like something changed when it's like your homeworks, you're not doing as well as you're supposed to be doing. So my parents were very on top of that. Um, and just having some some opportunities as well for, for travel and, and, and different things. So looking back, I'm, I remember recently I told my, I was talking to someone, I was like, I never had to worry about that. Like I never had to worry about that that struggle or challenge. So I do consider that very fortunate for that. But um, yeah, I was the first person to get a doctorate in my family and my father followed me about a year later. I still tease him. I got my Dr. Thomas, you know, first <laughs> for it. But, but yeah, but I had a very, very supportive. Um, and I think that is not necessarily your immediate family, but you do have to have a support system to, to go through graduate school and, and other aspects like that. Um, it greatly helps for it. And I did have that. And I still have that with, with family and, and friends. 
So I'll talk a little bit about your your experience in the industry before before kind of veering towards academia. Um, as you were still kind of considering maybe being a winemaker or working in the industry, tell me about your initial impressions of what it meant to work in wine and what kind of role you could have seen yourself having. That's interesting because I don't think I ever really considered I was going to go, you know, some people, I have a student now, um, ex-military, she is going to be a winemaker. She has told me this. <laughs> she is going to be, and it's like, that's fine. That's good to know. I will help you achieve that goal <laughs> um, for it. But I never had that I am going to be, you know, a winemaker or a enologist. It was always I'm going to be a scientist mm -hmm. for it. So I, I don't think there was ever sort of this, I think it was I could do this, but it wasn't ever quite the goal for it. Um, I do remember wanting to go into Gallo because I wanted to learn. I wanted to make wine specifically. And I remember my father going, you're, you're not, you're going to be so tired. And I'm like, no, I'm aware. And I'm going to be sore and I'm going to be tired. I think I lost 10 pounds over harvest or something like that. I remember specifically, um, we were trying not to work on Thanksgiving and all these stinking red ferments got done the day before. So we were going to have to press off. So I looked at the two other interns. It's like, we're showing up early because I'm not missing Thanksgiving dinner because of these ferments. <laughs> so I think we showed up at like six o'clock to press off like nine fer ferments, but we got done by 12. So all of us made it to Thanksgiving dinner that day um, for it. So that was an experience, but that one was specifically, I wanted to learn how to make wine. And then going to Australia was experiencing a new area, but that was really lab work. And I knew how to do lab work that did expose me to a production lab. Like some of that, like, like I could run aeration oxidation sulfurs, like with enough setups, I can do like 10 and 30 minutes, just like boom, boom, boom. We used to have a couple competitions, like, okay, who can do this? Um, I realized I didn't want to be a technician at that point in time. So I knew I was going to have to get a higher degree for it. And again, the Mandavi one wasn't, wasn't necessarily like, oh, because this is what I want to do. It was a different experience. Because at that point, I was like, I think Mandavi I'd worked out and sent applications in that I was going to go to grad school. I remember in Australia, I'd made that mine and started to, started to apply. And Mandavi was because New Zealand doesn't start until February. So it was like, okay, let's go do another harvest somewhere until term starts. But I never sort of had that. I do remember thinking I could easily just keep doing this. Or if I want to go to school, I need to go to school now. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I could have done it a little more, but I never had the, I want to be a winemaker. And I talked to people and it's like, one of the big things was, which I find hilarious based on this year, um, the sort of, you're never home during harvest, like the sheer amount of time you're just, you're just constantly. And I laugh because this year for harvest, like seven days a week with all the ferments we were doing and everything was crazy. Yeah. I ended up, I... <laughs> To be fair, we did not anticipate the level of, we were doing small ferments for a project. I think we did something like 800. I needed like triple the people we had. I did not think it was going to take that amount of time. So I laugh now because particularly this year, it was, you know, what I'd like to avoid, what I wanted to avoid. Yeah, but it was never like I wanted to be a winemaker. I I'd, I'd sort of tell people I can do it because I've done it and I do it now for things, but I like the puzzle that research and there's still puzzles with my winemaking because it's different each year, but I like my research puzzle more than I enjoy, enjoy my winemaking puzzle, I guess is what I'd say for that. Um, for And like, I didn't want to be a technician knowing this. And I remember in Australia realizing I didn't want to be a technician, I needed to be the boss. So that was like, okay, we got to get a doctorate to do that. Uh, yeah, that was a very specific. It's like, I remember talking to my father, I want to be in charge. And he was like, well, you got to get a doctorate then. So you mentioned as you were kind of honing in from f food science first and then towards wine, and then you mentioned uh, flavor chemistry as being the thing. So tell us, kind of tell us what flavor chemistry actually means and how that became the thing you wanted to focus on. So there are so many cool things in food science. I was on the product development team as well. We had won um, a competition or two. Even now when I go to conferences, I'm like, oh, that's so cool. Why am I, <laughs> why am I not doing that? <laughs> flavor chemistry really looks at, um, the smell of things or volatile compounds, aromas, actually 80% um, of your experienced eating food has to do with smell. And people look at me and they're like, no, what are you talking about? Hold your nose next time you're eating something you like. There are five tastes. That's it. Almost everything else is smell for it. And there's hundreds of compounds um, to that. 
And there's a lot of different work that goes into measuring those compounds, figuring out people's sensitivities to it. So one of the, um, I had a, a pioneer, Terry Agree from Cornell, who's still there. I'm just like, when is he retiring um, for this? A lot of us sort of tease him. It's like, what are you doing? You should be enjoying life at this point. Um, he's going to be at a conference actually this summer um, that I'm organizing. Um, they proved that identical twins aren't that identical based on your sense of smell. It comes down to your genet genetics and things. So much of the food industry is flavor and figuring out compounds. There are flavor houses. You want a strawberry flavor for your product. Well, here's a wall of different strawberries, um, particularly some of the low fat, no fat products. A lot of flavor is delivered through lipids or fats. So you have to have a very different formulation for different types of products, beverages versus solid foods, other things like that for it. Um, I always found it very fascinating when I looked into it for it. So it was sort of like, oh, that would be that would be quite quite cool to do. Um, I am not a strict flavor chemist. I probably now do 50-50 sensory with flavor chemistry um, for it, but it was always found me interesting and it's used, it's used all over the like every single food product out there has flavor chemistry involved in, in it in some way. So tell me how that then specifically related to wine as you started to kind of as you started to understand wine, what were the sort of the main focuses in flavor chemistry? So I I wasn't able to do flavor chemistry on um, Cornell. Thomas was a wine microbiologist. And if I remember correctly, he was really the only wine person there for research. So I went in and looked at a work, looked at a project on understanding how Brit Britannomyces grew. And it grows on practically nothing at any, at any point in time for it. But my start for flavor chemistry was we were mething all the eth measuring all the ethyl phenols involved, which to me smells like Band-Aid and horse sweat, depending on your concentrations. Not nice things for it. But I still knew I wanted, even though I had that microbiology, it's like, no, I really want to do flavor chemistry. So when I went to New Zealand, um, I got to write the project. So that's why I consider it very fortunate. My professor was like, well, if you write this project, we'll, we'll put it in and we'll do it. So it was flavor chemistry. It was doing the sensory on these Pinot Noirs from different areas and measuring all these aroma compounds and trying to figure out if we could find a link between any of the smells um, and flavors that were coming from these different terroir products versed on that, and I got hooked. Like that puzzle, I got hooked. I mean, that is one of the primary things I do now. And I'm gonna use the term figuring out the cause of smells, because so much work is correlation. And we do specifically do a lot of methodology. That is, once you've got the correlation, we, we prove if it's an actual cause or not for it. Um, yeah, I remember doing that and, and being really fortunate that I was able to do that. But yeah, I got I got hooked um, on on not initially the machines, like some of the machines we use to measure these things. Ugh, maintenance is a bitch. Um, <laughs> anyone who's run a GCMS or LCMS knows this um, for it. So some of that it's cool, uh, but at the same time, it's a pain in the ass um, for it. But yeah, oh, I still find it fascinating. There's so many things we don't understand. Complex mixtures like wine. And, and as I said, I'm doing a bit of coffee now, complex mixtures, what is important and what combinations cause these smells that people like or don't like. It is a puzzle that will be keeping me employed for, for many years. So before we get to the kind of work you've done with wine, I'm curious about how did you go about sort of educating yourself about wine on a, just kind of a, from an enjoyment level, from a consumer perspective, how did that process work for you? I actually remember my first time not having a good experience with wine. Apparently I just picked a random bottle and it was, this probably goes into the fact that I don't particularly, I've had nice Chardonnays, but it's not my first choice because the first bottle I ever had, looking back, I didn't know better. It was a bad Chardonnay. And looking back, like on several levels, it was a bad Chardonnay. <laughs> I, I remember being experienced and like my father, you know, trying to describe a little, oh, taste this and that, and, you know, whatever, explaining things. And I know we always had, um, so my family's primarily Italian and getting together with the holidays and stuff. And there was always Carlo Rossi, or I remember not liking the sherry, my grandfather. Um, and I don't like Sambuca either, because <laughs> that was always, you know, a little bit of Sambuca in the coffee. No, I don't like Sambuca. Um, that licorice mm -hmm. flavor for it. But it was, it was one of those visiting places, and I still do this, visiting wineries and taking tours and just tasting wines. Um, yeah, and you, you just expose yourself to as much much as you can for it. I remember reading a lot, or like I'd hear something and I'd look up 
information on it. I used to actually journal the things I taste um, quite a bit because it's like, oh yeah, I remember like that one. What was this? I haven't done that in years um, anymore, but I do remember doing that specifically during my master's and a little bit afterwards or I travel, particularly when I travel, I do a lot of like, let's visit wineries and ask questions. Um, and I still do that actually. And you learn so much. Um, about wine when you do that. I probably learn more when I travel actually than just sort of being at home, unless I'm looking up something for teaching. <laughs> you mentioned New Zealand being your kind of first experience with, with Pinot Noir. So I'm curious about your initial impressions of Pinot Noir, again, sort of from a, just from a pleasure drinking perspective, but also from sort of the scientific perspective. So it's interesting because I primarily drank a lot of Italian wines. I remember getting Bola for Christmas from my father once, which is, was a big brand and is not as well known anymore for it. I remember going to New Zealand and having Pinot Noir and it's very light. And I didn't realize how light it was in the mouth until I came back to the US and tasted, I think the first ever Pinot Noir I had here was from Archery Summit, which is quite a dense Pinot Noir. And I actually remember going to James Osborne going like, is that a Cabernet? What's going on? Um, and it's because the mouthfeel of, of New Zealand Pinot Noir is so light um, for that. I remember it was more because I was doing terroir and I got to taste some nice Pinot Noirs in that project. I mean, I think we had 40 or 45 wines in it and we're talking, some of them were considered some of the top. Oddly enough, probably one of the most top ones I was not a huge fan of. <laughs> Everyone has different preferences, right? I look at someone, it's like, it's not a bad wine, it's just not my preference for that wine. I remember having a memorable trip to Central Otago and a couple of my favorites down there were, um, I think Shard Farm has this road on like a cliff face and that's more about a memory connected with the wine than necessarily the wine <laughs> for it. Um, I don't remember going like, oh, this Pinot is amazing, or oh, I hate this. I just remember, because I think the first Pinot I ever had, oh no, this is a funny story. Um, I couldn't drink wine for the first six months in New Zealand because, um, and it actually happened when I went to California, because um, I'd gotten sick and I was on medication and I couldn't drink any, everything. And I was helped like the third day I was in New Zealand, a really good friend of mine still, Belinda Kemp, she had to go out and take vineyard measurements at Pegasus Bay. And she, didn't grow up driving because she grew up in London. So I just, remember she, I just remember she was stressing out and I was like, well, you want me to drive? I don't have anything to do today. And she's like, oh, you'll drive. She still does it. It's like, you're driving. <laughs> um, and so I remember going out to Pegasus Bay and, and the winemaker got like, went, why aren't you drinking wine? And I would just went, I, I'm on medication. I can't drink wine. And they were really upset about it. I was like, I can't like for a couple months now, I can't drink wine. So I didn't actually drink Pinot Noir for like three or four months in New Zealand because I had to get over this medication that I was taking. Um, it happened in California too um, for it. Um, I remember that it was like the week I mowed the lawn without not in sneakers and I'd, I'd gotten bitten by a tick. Um, and it was like a couple days beforehand and they're like, you might or might not have Lyme disease. We're just gonna make you take the pills anyways, and it, but you can't drink alcohol for, <laughs> and it was like, cool, I'm going to Napa and I can't drink any wine. <laughs> um, so I don't have a firm memory of like, oh, I really liked this Pinot or not, probably because I was exposed to it quite a bit, but I couldn't actually taste any of it for, I wanna say it was four or five months in until I could, could actually taste it. Yeah, the fact that that happened twice, that was. <sighs> I do remember really, really liking actually um, some of the white wines when I was in New Zealand. Because um, Pegasus Bay was also known for their Riesling and other things. I, I do remember having some very, not Sauvignon Blanc, interestingly enough, because I didn't have Sauvignon Blanc until I'd went up and worked for Pernod Ricard for a while. And I'm not a huge fan of that. They were, they actually finally had some restrained ones because the industry, a couple years before I was there, they were really, you know, let's go files all the way. Um, and I'm not a big fan of the over <laughs> for varieties. And I remember going to Marlboro and like having a couple like, oh, that one's really nice actually. Um, and someone laughed when they said that because like, yeah, we do, we, not everyone goes over. I remember having more memories actually about the white wine in New Zealand than I do about some of the red wines. The red wines kicked in once I had my project. But, and that's probably because I just hadn't had tons of experience with, with red wine. Upstate New York is more white wine focused. And I was growing Brett and red wine and media, so that's not a great introduction to red wine. <laughs> 
Yeah, that would turn you off for a while, yeah. I feel like. Yeah, for sure. So before coming to Oregon State, did you have any impressions of Oregon or the Oregon wine industry? The only thing I knew about Oregon before coming out for my interview, because I'd never been, um, was it was considered to be very similar to New Zealand. And I knew a lot of New Zealand winemakers had done back and forth for it. Um, and I remember coming out for my interview because I'd flown in from New Zealand, New Zealand and I was super jet lagged. Um, and they actually, when you interview, and it's sort of a university thing, when they interview, everyone kind of asks you the same question. Because I remember being halfway through the day, like wanting to stamp something on my forehead, like this is how I'm going to get funding. Could you please ask an original question? <laughs> but actually what happened my last year in New Zealand was um, I was in Christchurch for all the big earthquakes for it. Um, and what you don't realize, and I didn't realize this until I was home after my interview here, I hadn't really been sleeping because there were aftershocks. Like people don't realize like daily for months for it. And I hadn't really been sleeping because I remember being in an interview here at this table and a truck had come by that rumbled really loudly. And that's the sound before the big earthquakes. Because someone afterwards literally was like, were you okay? There was a minute there. It's like I was five seconds from being under that table because it was like, there is an earthquake <laughs> um, for it. And I remember coming out and my phone broke coming into town. So like, I wasn't even sure I was, was going to make it into Corvallis for that. I ended up in Albany thinking that was Corvallis and then finally worked out that was not. <laughs> um, so, so came in for it. It was in the winter. Winter's not that exciting here. It rains a lot. And as I said, I was way jet lagged um, for it. I met, I'm trying to remember, I didn't necessarily meet the wine industry the first time I interviewed mm -hmm. here. They actually, cause I flew home for Christmas um, to the West Coast, and I got a call asking if I'd come back on my way out to meet with the wine industry. And sort of you know when that's going to happen. It's like, oh, they're probably going to offer me this job. Mm -hmm. So I remember meeting people, and they were, it's the wine industry in general. I mean, New Zealand, they were cool. You know, there isn't a lot of pretentious, there isn't a lot of arrogance, anything like that. I remember coming to Oregon being like, these guys are chill. Um, very similar to New Zealand because a little bit in Napa you do get this, you know, oh I work in Napa um, For it um, and every place you do have some people like that It's not just specific to California, but on the whole at least the people I met um, Were very cool. I think it was Ted Castile I remember having dinner with Lynn Penrash and her husband and apparently I picked up a stomach virus on one of my flights and they drove me back to Portland and I remember and I've told her the story many times it's like I remember you guys chatting and I'm trying not to throw up in her brand new car that she told me she would got for her birthday <laughs> and like that my primary memory of the Oregon industry is trying not to throw up in Lynn Penrash's car on the way to the airport actually so I did not have a typical like but I do remember thinking oh these are like the people I know in New Zealand, it's very sort of, they want to help each other um, of just, I think the four or five people I'd met. And I remember thinking, oh yeah, it's pretty good wine. Um, I don't have the knowledge I do now for that, but I remember enjoying, enjoying that. But yeah, again, the primary memory was trying not to throw up on the way in Lynn's car for that. Like wine and health issues seems to be kind of a running theme here. So, well, and particularly in new spots. We worked that out. That was from a plane ride. I was like, how I know incubation works for this and everything. It was the flight from Los Angeles. That was the one that did it. Because um, I was getting nauseous. They took me to dinner at the Allison. And I was starting to get nauseous. And the food was gorgeous. And I was just like, I can't eat this. And I didn't realize I was sick until like an hour or two later. I was like, oh, no, I'm sick. <laughs> So as you took the job here, what was the sort of initial, what were the initial goals or what was the initial thing that was expected of you and what, what was the role, what was the role you were trying to fill? The big role here was they wanted someone to come in and do wine sensory. And I had wine sensory from my doctorate. I didn't consider myself a wine sensory scientist. Now I do. I've done it so much. I do consider myself then. Then I still consider myself a bit more flavor chemistry who did wine sensory. Now, as I said before, it's a 50-50 for it. But it was to come in to support projects with wine sensory. Because while we do have sensory science in the building, um, sensory science covers everything. And the wine industry has so much that requires sensory that you needed another person for that. So um, I was also a few years after the Oregon Wine Research Institute started, and I think that I don't know all the details for it, but I think it was part of starting that was they wanted a position in Southern Oregon 
I, don't quote me on the Southern Oregon one, but there were one or two positions, and mine was one of those that was deemed necessary um, for that. So it was primarily to come in and do sensory, and I was also an expert on Pinot Noir. And like we had, they had, I think if I remember correctly, James, James Osborne um, had sort of started some of the OWI winemaker tasting panel, some training the year before, but that's a lot of work for it. So I was, it was an um, ex expectation I would come in and continue that, which we did all the way up to COVID. Now we're going to try and do a revamp of it. Um, revamp as in we're going to deliver samples to the wineries and mail them so we don't have to, <laughs> so they can do it in-house. I'm hoping to get higher participation. <laughs> So tell me about the first first year or two. What were the sort of the, the big the big things you dove into first? Um, I had to teach like a term after, and I remember surviving teaching <laughs> and going, they don't prepare you how to teach in grad school. <laughs> um, and I had I had a lot of really good advice and and I know I went and I asked a lot of questions, but I remember something I did um, that I didn't realize people don't do. So I do consider food science as very an applied science. You can do basic science, but there is a big applied aspect. And for wine research, there is still a big applied. And what I mean by applied is you're taking that science and you're applying it to the actual industry or field. So communicating that. So I remember, I think I started the middle of July because there are some weird start dates. It's like, you can't start there, start here. Um, and I remember making a bunch of interviews for a month or two to meet the winemakers in the Willamette Valley specifically and just introduce myself and talk to them. And while that took a lot of time, that was hugely beneficial. They met me, but I also sort of got a feel for what people felt the Oregon wine industry needed from us. Um, and I remember sitting in something years later, they asked me to do a panel and people were asking questions like, how am I supposed to do this? And I remember going, you make the, you set them up yourself. Like no one's going to do this for you. You just go do it. I think I, at the OWRI said, could you send this email out to everyone and whoever responds, I'll go take a meeting with. Um, but I went to them for it. So that was, but I remember days or at least one day a week for a couple of months, I would go out and I met many of the different winemakers and just they chatted about the wine industry, and that was that was hugely beneficial to to seeing because I didn't have a real good idea what I should be doing research wise or anything. The only thing I ended up doing, which got partially funded by the Oregon Wine Board, was a terroir of Willamette Valley, which I actually do have the five years of worth of data. We just have to get the time to sit down and write the paper. I presented it left and right for it, and someone went, "Where's the paper?" And it's like I need like you know, 80 weeks in a year instead of 52, it's on the list <laughs> for it. So I remember someone, several people were like, we'd really like you to do this. So I put something to the Oregon Wine Board, but I remember thinking it's like, okay, I got to figure out now what I want to do. Because the first couple of years is number one, you sort of say yes to almost anything anyone asks you. So I supported a lot of projects because you just have to get your funding program up and running um, for it. Um, and then after a year or two, realizing like, okay, this is what my research, where I want my research to go, um, and focusing a little bit more, more on that for it. But yeah, no, the first couple of months was meeting a lot of people, um, prepping for class, because James Kennedy was my predecessor, but there was a five-year gap, five years or more, I want to say, um, and they never cleaned his lab out. I remember showing up and being like, you are so lucky I know his work, because like, no one, five years. It was disgusting. Um, and I later learned you can contact EHNS and they'll do it for you. And I like actually lost my temper. I'm like, why did someone not do this? What is happening? This is atrocious. Because um, within the first couple of years, we actually didn't have enough space in the storage for the winery. And I looked at James and it's like, I'm cleaning it out. And I do it about every two years now. <laughs> it's like, we, got, we need room. We've got to get this stuff out. Um, but so I remember cleaning the lab very specifically for it. Um, I don't know where I was going with that one. Uh, but yeah, so, oh, James Kennedy. So um, Mark Daschle had been teaching class. He wasn't a wine person. So I remember looking at the syllabus going, this isn't appropriate for a senior level course. And he was doing a great favor. Like we didn't have anyone. So he did the best he could for it. Um, so I remember spending a lot of my first time reorganizing and figuring out how I wanted to teach that class to bring it to the level that I thought was appropriate for a senior level class for it. So there was a lot sort of teaching and just meeting people and sort of figuring figuring things out and then surviving winter term, which was when I teach. And apparently I came in on a challenging cohort of students because I remember James going, 
how'd it go? And it was like, I thought I'd like teaching more than, more than I did. And he went, yeah, it's been a tough year for everyone. And looking back now, apparently it was, we put in some new, um, qualifications for certain things. Um, but yeah, that was rough that year. Um, oddly enough, the most problematic student was very successful working in the wine industry <laughs> at a level. I think he was seller, seller work for the most part, but it was just like, wow, he was a pain in the ass. Um, I'm not naming names. <laughs> um, we should have brought more wine to get that. Um, before, I, I'm curious about your research focus, but I, I'm, I'm also curious, as you were meeting winemakers at this time and asking them about that, what, what were the responses? What were, they, what were they hoping Oregon State or your particular position would bring to the industry? That was interesting, because I don't have any specific, specific memories about like, oh, you're gonna do this this for us. Um, I do remember a lot of people being excited because some of the vineyard treatments and things and, and particularly um, Patty's statewide crop load, I came in to support some of the sensory on that. People were really excited to see those things for it. So I think they were more excited about just having this, um, OWI talks about grape to glass um, research for it. So they were finally having that last puzzle piece of, of that happening. Um, for that, but I don't have anything sticks out that it was just like, oh, you know, this is gonna, you're gonna do this, or, or at the time, you know, there was a specific problem. Um, I just remember having some really nice conversations with people, because sometimes it can be a little awkward, or you're just kind of like, what is going on right now? And I remember it was like really enjoyable just to meet people for it. And, and they were really excited. That was the other thing. Because sometimes you go into places and you sort of get a weird vibe. I remember both Oregon State and going to the industry. Like, they were really excited that I was there. Which is very, you know, welcoming when you show up somewhere. So as you started to narrow your research focus then, how did, wh what did you, what did you decide to focus on and, and why? Um... So it's kind of funny because what I focused on is actually huge um, and is that interplay between um, the chemistry and, and sensory for it. Um, we started a terpene project. So one of the things I wanted to do from my doctorate, if I had the opportunity, was um, look at how chiral compounds impact quality. So chiral compounds, terpenes in particular, some of those floral compounds, very important for aromatic whites. They... Um, are chiral, so there's two different forms. So they reflect reflect light differently, but they also have different smells. And there was research I had been reading about where people were like, we measured this, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't explain this. And it's like, but the chiral forms of that totally explain that right there. So I had, and Riesling was a thing here, and I love Riesling. I think Riesling does not get enough credit across the board. It's a tricky one for, for consumers just because there's so many different different things. And I hadn't even had German Riesling at that point in time. I had like upstate New York, New Zealand, and Oregon at that point in time. But I am a very big Riesling fan <laughs> for it. And thinking this would be a really good project so I could get to have a boatload of Rieslings. Because um, you got to have fun with what you're doing too. Um, so and I had gotten, I want to say that was funding from the Oregon Wine Board for that one was looking at the chiral composition of terpenes. Um, and we got some, we measured all of that, um, have that information. We did a boatload of sensory. I had a doctoral student do it. We, it was a fantastic project for getting things forward. And people actually use some of the methodology we developed from that project. Um, but I remember having a lot of fun with that. Because I can't say it's, 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 it's um, a conundrum, right? We, we have Pinot here. And so you do get a little tired of Pinot, but at the same time, it's gorgeous Pinot. So I'm sort of like, sometimes I feel silly being like, I can't, I can't drink wine now. And someone's like, and I'm like, I know it's gorgeous, right? But we just ran a huge sensory panel. I smell like Pinot. <laughs> um, it's like, I need a break. So we were going to do a little re Riesling um, for that. And I remember we were doing a terroir panel and I was supporting, um, someone up at Portland State for, for um, Scott Burns, who's a great geologist for it. He had a student and was asking us to do, um, I still have her thesis in there, because for years I was asking, I need this piece of information to do this sensor, I need this information. And finally, like uh, five years ago, he sent it to me, and it's just like, I don't have time to do this right now. Like I had it like three years ago. And I was like, so, I, and then he retired, I think. And I was like, Scott, is this cool if we don't? <laughs> Um, he was like, yes, it's fine <laughs> um, for it. Um, that was, he was lovely. That was a great, I still see him every now and then for that. Um, 
Yeah, so I, rem I remember that recently one because I really want to do it. We still do a bit of chiral, <laughs> chiral work on, on some other things, not that we hold any funding specifically for it at the moment. Um, but that started a bunch of work on terpenes that we still do. We, we have this long path that involves terpenes um, that surprisingly, I had a Fulbright student from Mexico come in. So with that, you can kind of do whatever you want. Um, and, and so I gave her a few things and she said, I want to do this and I want to figure out it's terpene interaction. So we had all this information, but we didn't know which one was causing what specifically. So we were starting to build different combinations in a wine and see, see what smells came out of it. So she did that in, in Gewurztraminer and, um, a Pinot Gris style base, if I remember correctly. I'm trying to get that second paper published. Um, so she still did terpenes on that. And one of the weird outcomes was there's a couple combinations of terpenes that push tropical fruit. And I know we just, I love it when you get this from funding agencies, because the wine industry, they do, they do a valiant job, but there's never enough money. So we put in one this year for um, predictive modeling for tropical fruit aroma that includes styles and esters and these terpenes, something else. And we literally got back, she's a good track record for this. We really like this project, but we don't have enough money, so you're not getting funding for it. So I was like, okay, I mean, fair enough, I understand. Um, but at the same time, it's like, I want someone to fund this so we can work this out. Um, and terpenes smell nice, I'd like to add, because as you know, I work with a lot of stuff that doesn't smell nice. <laughs> um, so terpenes smell nice, so we like those for it. So I remember that that keeps going. Um, and we had done the Pinot Noir terroir. That was a five-year study for that, because um, we did it every single year. Um, and there were, there were a lot of wineries in the Willamette Valley that donated bottles each, each year for that. Um, as I said, I presented it. I just haven't sitting down and down and written, written it. And I remember getting involved because of terroir and things like that. Like I got involved in a dairy project cause we, we proved terroir exists for cheddar. And there was another dairy one too. I feel like there was an off flavor. Yeah. Oh, there's a weird problem with chocolate milk that they're trying to fix. Um, that we we've, we've helped out with something. <laughs> Most people know nothing about food. You're fine. It's okay. If you buy it in the store, it's great. <laughs> but from a like there's a problem that started to occur before they packaged it. <laughs> oh, I can tell stories about most people have know nothing about food and how their food is prepared and other things that happen for it. Um, it's almost lunchtime. We don't we don't need Yeah, to I was just like someone once looked at me once like you don't want to know cuz I have a I'm a very good friend with the food safety person and and she started going to something. I'm like, hold, you know, I love these stories, but I like to eat eggs. So I don't want to know anything about eggs because <laughs> she's like, I have stories. It's like, I don't want to know about eggs. I like my eggs. Um, cause I got put off peanut butter for like a good six to eight months for something once. Um, but, or I just get random texts of like, don't buy chicken from here. It's like, okay. <laughs> um, so um, but, but yes, but so Pinot Noir, there was that terroir project supporting a boatload of others, um, for it. And unfortunately the reason why I don't remember a lot is because everything is dominated by smoke now. Mm -hmm. So like, I don't even, I'd have to go back and look at papers at this point in time. We've done some fun ones with students where we looked at the cause of, oh, the fruity project. Ha, how can I forget the fruity project? The fruity project is famous in my mind. Cause I also got one of my best doc, uh, students out of that. She came as an internship from Brazil for six months as an undergrad. And then she wrote a thesis and graduated and I offered her if she'd come out. So I, I think we had her for six years or something in total for it. She just got a great job last year um, in the dairy industry, but she's kicking butt um, for it. But so I called the Fruity Project. So we got funding from the American Vineyard Foundation. Um, I had been complaining about causation and how none of the statistics do causation for flavor chemistry and sensory. It's called chemometrics or sensometrics um, in research. And my father and I nerd out. He had gotten his doctorate a year after I had, and he did, he did um, I don't remember the exact term, but he used, um, it was about public safety networks and some of the analysis that why did this break down. So, so part of what they were looking at was um, when 9-11 happened, I think all the police managed to get out, but why didn't firefighters? And there was a, it was a breakdown in some of the communication networks and why did that happen? So like, there's a lot of things in your phones, you know, it's like, oh, you know, can you do this? It's a, it's a fuzzy set network in there that makes decisions for like Siri and things like that for it. So I was complaining about there's this and it doesn't exist. And this is, I don't want to keep doing the same old thing. And he's like, why don't you do this? And I was like, what's that? And we were sitting there, I think on the porch somewhere. Um, and he started to explain it to me and I was like, 
you know how to do that? And he was like, yes. And it's just like, I'm going to put in a project so we can do this fuzzy set network and apply it to all this stuff. And we got funding for it um, from the American Vineyard Foundation. Um, and we did it on white and red wines. And we, I, I, we developed the method of stripping all the aromas out of wine. Because I once asked a winemaker if they had a neutral smelling wine. And you'd thought I had insulted their child. <laughs> And I was like, it's for research. I need something that just doesn't have a smell. And someone afterwards, a friend was like, maybe you shouldn't ask winemakers that. Um, so we did it ourselves and I overfine it a bit. And we, we actually added special resin to strip everything out completely. And then I started adding different combinations of very specific amounts of aroma compounds in. And then we do sensory panels. And Angelica started that as um, an intern. I, she arrived at literally, no one was here. We were all at a conference. She arrived and as an undergrad, she started that whole project. And that was just like, I can't believe she did it. Most undergrads would not be able to do it. She actually finished it off too uh, when she came in for a doctorate. But we did it on a boatload of Pinot Noir, boatload of white wine, four years. Um, I've actually finally... I typed up the method to run it and I looked at my department head and I went, can I just go visit my family for two weeks and write this paper? Cause I really need my father for part of this. Cause the materials and methods are 12 pages long at the moment. <laughs> and she was just like, yeah, you're good. Just go. <laughs> um, Cause I'm like, I want to get this paper out. Um, I know other flavor chemists who look at this and they complain about the same thing. I'm like, this is a new way of doing this for it. Um, but yeah, that was, that was my first ever grant, I think for the American Vineyard Foundation um, for it. And it was such an exciting one, but what they, I remember a comment that I got for him and someone just went, she's going to be, this is over ambitious for her timeline. And then I remember writing the last report being like, as suggested in the first year, I did not get around to the last objective <laughs> um, for it. Apparently I know people who have been on the analogy board and they're like, you're very upfront about like what's working and what's not working. <laughs> um, so, so yes, yeah, so I remember that we still use that method trying to get that paper out, but that was a big, and that's really pushed a lot of my, my program now was that project in particular. Um, it's been presented left and right, but I just, there's two, the issue is they're monster papers. You know, there's papers and then there's like, mm -hmm. it's a monster. So, but I'm starting to dedicate a couple weeks here and there. It's like, okay, we're gonna get this paper out. Um, I had to go through a little training. There was one year where all the little things got in the way and, and um, or I was letting them get in the way. So I got some really great career coaching here um, that it's like, okay, this is how we gotta get this back on track. So those were the big ones, and now of course it's smoke, smoke. left and right. So let's talk about smoke. Obviously, how you, you become no, you become known for wine smoke, grape smoke. So tell us how that tell us how that happened. Um. So Oregon hadn't had a huge problem with smoke compared to Washington and California in particular. Um, not to disparage Southern Oregon for it. They had dealt with some stuff, but at that point, Southern, it, it was a lot of the smoke from California that was hitting Southern Oregon for it. Um, I feel like I've even blanked out. Oh no, I do remember. Um, I can't remember what I did yesterday at this point in time. Like things are busy enough. Someone, someone asked me to do something. I turned around. I, someone asked a question, I turned around again and I just went, I'm supposed to do something, but I don't remember what I'm supposed to do. And the student was like, you are going to go photocopy this for me. It's like, great, come with me. We'll make sure I get it done. <laughs> um, if I remember correctly, Tom Collins had called up and said, hey, you've heard of this problem, right? And I said, yeah. And he's like, let's write a grant, a planning grant for for this to try and support the industry um, for it. Because I'd, I'd heard about it in New Zealand. I know a lot of the people who worked on it, but it was sort of like, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a problem, but not really. Mm -hmm. um, and I think two th that was right around 2017, 2018, I want to say. So California had had one, one big year um, for it. But I hadn't been going gung-ho, and Tom, Tom was, was sort of the main person for that grant. So we wrote it, didn't get anything for it. And then I started... Um, we just, we didn't have a big project or anything, but I was starting to look into it a bit more. And, and then of course, and then uh, we didn't get the planning grant. And sometimes it takes a couple of years. And I know we rewrote it and sent it in a second year and we didn't get it the second year. And I remember, so the USDA changes their deadlines quite frequently. Um, I remember it being like November or something and Tom calling and saying like, hey, should we give it one more try? And he's like, but here's the problem. I can't put it through WSU because they take six weeks to approve and get all this stuff in. Um, you know, 
and USC Davis takes an equally long time. And I went, as long as we got a budget, I can do this up to 30 minutes before the deadline here at OSU. Like they're very, <laughs> we have a great research office um, and, and grants office for the College of Ag for that. So it was purely accidental that I ended up being in charge of that. But then what happened is we got hit. <laughs> highly with 2020 and just everything turned over. It's like, it's like a lot of major problems that happen. I, I remember explaining something to COVID to something. It's like, we had all this research, but no one put it to this problem because we didn't know we had a problem, so, but it all existed. So it's just a shift. So I had all these methods and things like that for it. So we just shifted to apply them to smoke, as well as developing some, some more vineyard-based things. So of course we have these big smoke out tents and things like that for it. Um, but we had all the chemistry we needed. I came in and supported a lot of the sensory. We had all of those skills, all the methods for it. So I just sort of did a pivot. Um, and of course we've got quite a bit of funding for it. Um, Cause people always ask me, we need these problems solved. And it's like, you want them solved fast? Like I can give you a number. <laughs> um, this is, you throw a lot of money at something, it gets solved um, for it. You get a lot of people involved. It will get solved eventually. Um, um, for it. Um, my parents think it's hilarious because something that I did in New Zealand to help out the company was to do some of the first ever thiol measurements in Sauvignon Blanc, which used mercury back then for it. So I hated it. They don't use it anymore, but I hated doing that. And oh, look, I'm back to thiols. <laughs> Again, and these ones are gross styles too um, for it. But but yeah, it really snowballed and, and we've been very successful and a little bit lucky with some of it um, as well for that. But it's just applying a lot of the methods we've been using for more than 10 years on a, on a completely different, just a different, you know, instead of this wine, we're doing it on this wine instead for it. So, yeah. So as... Uh Obviously, there have been a little bit of smoke and argument. So, so that obviously there was the gorge fire a couple of years before 2020. Uh, as 2020, as you're seeing the smoke and as you're sort of starting to shift that way, uh, what were some of sort of the initial, maybe your initial realizations or initial discoveries you had from, based on sort of the smoke from that year? It was actually a little bit more, not just 2020, but before, because I remember conversing with several people, um, Brian Irvin, Nicole Schultz, a few other people in Southern Oregon about the issue. Because I, I used to go down, um, before COVID, I would try and go down once a year, if not more, and I'd choose a couple different winemakers to talk to um, for it. And I remember we were chatting quite a bit. So I started looking into, look, looking into like what was known and what people were doing. And as I said, I know a lot of the people in Australia who do this work, they've done a great job. But I remember sitting down thinking, this is not the answer. Because <laughs> if it was the answer, then we'd be way more successful at it. Um, and I've always, I think it comes to something, um, I don't play a lot of video games because I get involved. But like I was a big fan of the Myst series and puzzles and things like that. And, you know, you try and solve the puzzle and you wouldn't solve it. You try and solve it, you wouldn't. And after like the third time, I'd sit there and it's like, okay, the definition of what insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. So I need to do something different. So I do remember, because I talk about it even now today of like, I thought about smoke as this box. And it's like, we need to rotate the box and come at it from a different angle for it. And that's where some of the isotope labeling um, came from. Because it's like, we have to do something different. Um, because clearly we don't have all of the answers for, for what's happening um, for that. And I think I was getting frustrated in what I was reading because I was like, they're just perpetuating the same thing. And it's clearly not. There's only so many times you can read the same thing. And it's like, that's clearly not doing it for it. So I remember thinking, you know, let's shift it and, and let's go to a couple different angles. Um, for that, but that was primarily in a lot of conversations to see what people were dealing with in Southern Oregon for it. Because of course, 2020 just happened. It was just like, I mean, just like, because I remember we had gotten calls to do smoke testing, and I'm sure the Oregon industry doesn't know this, but I said no up front that we were not going to do it. And there are a lot of reasons why I said no for it. And then about a week later, I got a call from the dean that said, you're doing this. And I went, that's interesting because I can't get into the building for it. Like there had been so much snow that um, smoke, the air filters had shifted off and there was ash on all this equipment for it. So it's like, I'm going to need some special permission, but I'm not going in until the air system's up and running. I mean, I had been in the house, you know, everything's sealed up. It's like, okay, I'm good. We don't have to go out. I'm fine. And then, and then all of a sudden it's like, no, you are doing this. And it was just like, okay. 
so everything stopped. Everything stopped. Because that was also the one, one, the other thing. Like, people don't realize, like, oh, we want you to do this. It's like, I have a lot of other things I'm doing that have deadlines. We stopped everything for two to three months to do that. Um, I mean, I tease people, and I've said it at the Oregon Wine Ind Industry Symposium. It's like, I unplugged my phone because so many people were calling. It's like, I can take your calls or I can measure your samples, but I can't do both for it. Um, and I've still blocked out periods of that. Um, it's the one time I actually yelled at a student because a part on the machine broke right as we were going to start taking samples. And I'd gotten a replacement part, and I put it in, and it broke. Um, <laughs> these are teeny tight. Like, if you over-tighten by, like, a millimeter, it's dead. And so I remember sitting there, like, standing there looking at it, and a student came over, and I just turned around and went, read the room, go away. <laughs> <laughs> and like, and and apparently a lot of people were shocked because I don't do that. <laughs> and like, I remember thinking I have this old part; it was bent, but I could straighten it, so I got it in. But I remember the next day, like, because I, I went and apologized, but I was just like, you needed to realize that was not the time to come do this. <laughs> and she was just like, I was a little shocked, but I also apologize. I should have. <laughs> um, like, the, my students still remind me about that. They're like, do you remember the time you did that? And I was like, yes, I'm aware. I remember the time um, for it. And yeah, it was just, I remember people driving down to drop off samples. Um, I remember saying we're giving an estimate because we started to take samples because because we got things shipped in and FedEx was like, they're going to be dropped off on this day. So I was like, cool, we'll start taking samples the next day. Well, they didn't tell us that everything was stopping up at what it would, wouldn't Wilsonville or something like that. Five days I was getting samples in and nothing had come from FedEx. I was literally like, I can drive up by five and pick this stuff up. What is the problem? <laughs> and people were calling, what about our samples? It's like, we're waiting for a delivery. I have everything. I have it in order. Um, it's, we, will, we wanted to be doing these already. I need this stuff to come in for it. Um, so that eventually came in, but we were already backed up at that point in time, the sheer amount of samples. And to the point where I had to say we're only accepting samples from 9 to 12 in the morning. Because I'd come in, I'd come in from like going to get a bottle of water or something, and I'd come in and there was just like boxes outside my door. It's just, and it's not everyone followed the instructions of how to label things. <laughs> I remember one where it was just like, I don't know who to, like I don't even know what winery this is for that. But yeah, we did, um, I tallied it up later on, something close to 800 samples in total over the course of like two months for it. Um, and it, it took us the better part of a year and a half to, to catch up from stopping research from that um, for it. So, so yeah, so we will, we will have a new dedicated lab for that. It is not my job to do that. Um, though we will support should we have that, should we have that again. And it was a great benefit to the industry, but, but that was, I mean, we stopped everything. And you know how I said, oh, this year we worked 24 seven for that. I essentially didn't sleep for two months because we also didn't have, we didn't have staff for that. We weren't expecting to have to do that. I had two student, international students who flew in the week of one of those fires and like were starting. And I was just like, just stay in your house, okay? Don't come out. <laughs> and no one was at OSU for it. I mean, it was, it was ridiculous for that, but yeah, so that, so I know it was a great benefit to the industry, but I still get like little anger issues um, about it. Um, but what has been really nice in doing all of this work, we try and communicate as much as we could, because there's also a lot of myths out there, you know, just anecdotal. Well, I did this and it worked, and it's like, eh, that, that doesn't, from a chemical standpoint, that doesn't actually do what you think it did um, for it. Because we don't want people to, because a lot of times I get like, oh, but this company said this, and it's like, give it a try, you need a control. But like, if it really did what it said it did, I would not have to do this research <laughs> um, for it. I would love it if someone had that um, for it. Um, but what has been really, really appreciative is how appreciative and, and the industry has said thank you in many ways, which doesn't always happen. Um, and that is really, really appreciative because you do put a lot of work in this. And I tell students, like, if you're doing a job to get someone to thank you for it, like, you shouldn't be doing. You're going to be very disappointed. Um, but what has been very unexpected was um, the level of sort of appreciation from the industry for that. Um, and ongoing, because, of course, we're still ongoing, and I still get it. But, like, I know it's funny. I tease sometimes, but I said once and at, you know, like, if if you still got smoky wine, I'm collecting. I had numerous messages <laughs> that they're like, no, we can get you. What do you want? I mean, we're going down, students are going down to a conference in California and they're like, 
we're, we got this stuff in barrel. You said you wanted some um, for it. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's, it's a, it's happened everywhere. Um, and maybe it's because I've been here so long now for it, but the level of partnership with industry, I don't know if that exists in other industries. I mean, I haven't really worked a lot in other food industries for it. And while the wine industry is dominated by some large companies as well, it's not quite like having a Coca-Cola mm -hmm. or, you know, there's like a top five that you don't realize they actually own a lot of the brands out there. Mm -hmm. um, and, but the wine industry, we do have some big boys as I like to put it in there, but even they are like, no, we need to as a whole fix this. So I really look actually a lot of what I do now and even from the start actually, but, but I think it's also, I've just been here longer. The partnership is fantastic. Um, and I don't initially think that happens in every industry. And that goes back to when I was in New Zealand, um, as well. And, and the, the, I, we have collaborators in California and not as much in Washington just because of the projects we've done, but a few in Washington as well. I do consider it a partnership and, and, um, yeah. So I'm curious then from what you've learned so far, and as you mentioned, kind of taking a different look at smoke yeah. than perhaps have been done before, what are the ma sort of main takeaways? What are the, what are the biggest things you've learned about how smoke affects wine and how to sort of combat it in the future? So um, it'll be a little disappointing for people, though we'll have a we should have a conversation in three to three to four years because I can give you a different answer then for it. Um, there isn't really any mitigation that works particularly, or if you're going to mitigate it, you're going to strip your wine of a lot of stuff for it. And there's I know industry wants something commercial. I'm frequently there. Wine Institute, other places, are like we need something we commer can commercialize, and it's like I understand that, but it needs to work and we're not there yet. We're working on it. We will get there. That's one thing I can say. We will get there, but I'm not going to rush it and have it not work properly for it. But unfortunately, mitigation doesn't work at the moment. We have some very good theories and ideas that we're testing for that. Um, I think the big thing is people have to get away from the phenols. We just finished a project on, on thresholds. Um, so my student is arguing with me because she wants to publish it now with one Pinot Noir wine. And I'm like, no, the point was to do it on three Pinot Noir wines so we can show stylistic differences. So we're in an argument about that, a friendly discussion. Um, I told her when she gets back, we can discuss and I'm open, but I also get the last say <laughs> for that. No, it's the big thing was, was jumping on those styles and we don't have all the compounds, um, all the styles for it yet. But in, in the threshold testing we're currently doing now, on non-smoked wine, thiols is driving ashiness. For people to notice a difference in phenols, you have to get so high that you might as well have a Brett infection in your wine for it. So unfortunately though, because thiols are a pain in the ass, um, it's going to take a couple of years to get testing that's going to be useful to the wine industry for it. So like we do know how to measure thiols because um, someone's like, great, you can measure these. Is it going to be easier than the current ones? It's like, ha! No, it's harder, <laughs> like significantly harder <laughs> um, to measure them um, for it. And we still haven't worked out great precursors yet because um, standards don't exist. I sat down and looked at someone. It's like, it's probably glutathione. I can get you a glutathione standard. And they're like, oh, but what's the other part? And it's just like, oh, it's got a sulfur on it. <laughs> like that's why we're, so we're getting some equipment that will be able to do that where I'm just like, I can give you a starting target on part of the molecule um, for it. Cause we really would like to have that. Here's an air measurement. This is what you got to look in the grapes. If you have to make your wine to figure out if you have smoke taint, we didn't do our jobs particularly well, but it's going to take a couple of years for it. But the science is out there. We're, we're chiseling off important pieces of information mm -hmm. um, for it. So yeah, it's something I tell, I tell a lot of people because I'm like, I know they want things now and we don't have it now, but we will have it. Like there's some research you do where you're like, this might not work. Or it's like, don't really know what's going to happen. But with this one, with everything we know about this, we will get there. It's just going to take a little bit of time. And to make sure it's scientifically robust and correct and will work properly. Because we're not going to release something that is not going to get it done. Um, so, yeah. So it's hard to be like, we're getting there when people are like, but why don't we have an event this year? And it's just like, I know. I know. And we don't have anything for you this year. But we're going. We're going to have something to the point where it's like, if you have an event, you might not have to worry about it. Um, I can't say that for everything, because if you have an event right next to your property and it goes on for a bunch of days, that's a very specific scenario. But some of those bigger ones and things like that, yeah, you're going to be able to, 
you're going to be able to have a product that doesn't taste smoky, but also tastes how you want it to taste. Instead of currently, the only thing you can do is you just strip that baby and keep stripping it for it. Um, and hopefully I will not have to work with these styles anymore because that would be really nice. They smell gross guys and they stick to you. I remember I make up pure um, high concentration standards late in the day and I thought I was okay. And then I go to the grocery store and, and I'm getting something and someone's like, cause I not just smoke styles, like um, Sauvignon Blanc styles I had made up sometime. And someone's like, it smells like a weird, a weird smell of like burnt and passion fruit. I don't understand what's going on. And I was just like, oh shit, I so smell right now. Um, cause styles bind to like your hair and your clothes and things like that. And I was just like, note to self, do not go to the grocery store after making these up. Just go home and shower. And like the clothes go in their own special laundry thing. And oh yeah. I remember just like getting out of the grocery store as fast as possible after that happened. I was just like, I clearly did not I can't smell it anymore because I was doing it. Um, yeah, that was really bad um, for it. But I'd like to, you know, maybe go back to some terpenes or some other things. James, James and I talk about some, some different projects where it would be nice not to have to deal with smoke files. But unfortunately, we're just at the start of working, working that out. But a goal is actually it was running overnight is to selectively remove just styles from a system. So we're working on a, we're also working on a project to improve the flavor of green vegetables. So people eat more green vegetables, similar chemistry to smoke taint. I'd like to add <laughs> um, for it. Um, Cause like I was drinking a, a juice, like a grape juice thing and the green juices, um, they have a very limited shelf life and they put like a lot of apple juice in. Cause when you pasteurize it, it smells gross for it. So we we're working on a technology to just remove the smelly compounds. Turns out they're very same compound class as smoke dials for it. Um, so actually it was running overnight last night. We're just trying to bind in a system, blow off the compounds and bind them up in a trapping flask for it. So like that's some of the mitigation. I'm like, we're trying to do selectively do this. Um, for it, but we have to start with some very basic chemistry to see if we can work. And so someone's like, but just do it to wine. It's like, it doesn't work like that. Like we have to prove it. We have to figure out the conditions. Then we have to do a couple other things Then we have to scale up. Then maybe we can do it in wine. And they're like next month. And I was like, that's probably going to be in two years. <laughs> like <laughs> I like the enthusiasm. If you want to throw some money my way to speed it up, we can talk about that. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, we're trying to, cause I don't, I realize I'm one of those people I don't eat, eat enough of those green vegetables. It's cause when they're cooked, they smell bad. And like, like canned spinach, have you guys ever had canned spinach? It's vile. And there's some parts of the world that that's what you get. Um, they don't have fresh vegetables. They don't have freezers or anything like that's your option. So I was sitting there like, coming up with ideas. And I'm like, what if we, instead of adding sugar, such as in juice and things like that, what if we just remove the gross stuff? And then someone was like, you could have a muffin with a serving of broccoli and no one would know it. And I'm like, I know, right? Isn't that a great way to eat broccoli? <laughs> or we were particularly thinking for like school lunches because they're still fairly high on salt and fat and things like that for it. Um, so that's where that idea came from. And I was just chatting with my student. He's like, it works with this methane thiol. And I said, you're running with thiols. And he went, yeah. And it's like, why don't you take this thiol and see what happens? So it's a smoke thiol um, for it. But yeah, we're going to put that in for the USDA this there. I really want to make vegetables, like more vegetables and random stuff. Because actually a product development competition we won in college. It was before this whole vegetable and desserts happened. We made a butternut squash single serving quick, low fat, high vitamin E, all these other claims you put in there for product development. Um, dessert that won the Danisco or we came second place in this big Danisco. I think it's now it's Mars for it. And it was because, and they really liked it because it was innovative. They're like, you have a vegetable and there's a dessert. That's really cool. This and that. But yeah, so that's like the first time I ever worked with vegetables, but I just, I don't, I'll eat raw spinach. I hate cooked spinach. Part of this I think is because all the cooked ones are smell like wine spoilage. Like I cannot do asparagus. I cannot do asparagus. And my mother gives me shit and I'm like, we have a whole lab where I make up high concentration spoilage standards so people can get trained. This spell smells like our reductive one. I'm not interested in putting it in my mouth. <laughs> so there is that extra added of like, this is why I don't like cooked vegetables. <laughs> but yeah, like, so, so not, but it, all of that, you know, it's something comes from wine. It's like, let's, let's do a little different. We're looking at the causes of some smells in coffee now. Cause I have a student who came in, she's a V and E student, um, from, 
Panama because their the family farm wants to see about growing grapes and stuff. And she came and looked at me and she's like, but my family does coffee and I'd love to do this. And, and do you have funding? And she's a really, really good student. So I was just like, yeah, I'll see what I can do. So we started to do coffee. We got that roaster donated. I went to this big coffee thing. The coffee industry is like 20, 25 years behind the wine industry, but the flavor chemistry, except for the fact it's in coffee, it's all the same how you work it out. Um, and unless you burn your roast, which we did do accidentally once, coffee tastes way better than smoke tainted wine. <laughs> and also we're starting with Panama Geisha, which is apparently the champagne of coffee. So I've been trained on really nice coffee. <laughs> but yeah, I, I decided ever since smoke taint and we did another spoilage one. Oh yeah, the stink bug stuff. I totally forgot about the stink bug stuff. There's a reason for that. We're not going into stink bugs. Thankfully, it's not a problem here. There was a thought it was going to be a problem. So we actually put stink bugs on a bunch of wine. And the stink bugs smell like cilantro, which I don't like. I have that soap taste to it. Um, Cause that was when stink bugs were a problem on the East coast. Do you guys not remember this? And they thought it was gonna be a big problem out here. So we prepped, we got money for it. We're like, you know, this is an issue. This is how many bugs you need per cluster. Sticking your arm in something to count bugs, gross. That's all I have to say um, for it. We made wine with it to see what level. And thankfully, like a couple years after we finished the project, they're like, no, I think they're, they're not a big problem here. I was like, okay, so I did all that for nothing. <laughs> I can't say nothing. We got a doctoral student out of it, a boatload of techniques and stuff, but like I never need to count bugs ever again. I don't. Yeah. Oh God, I totally forgot about stink bugs. That's how much I enjoyed that project. <laughs> um. So you express, expressing confidence on sort of where, where the smoke research is headed. What else are you looking at in terms of sort of wine and science that are either problems that are known now that you're working on or things that you may you think may become issues in the future that you want to like kind of dig into? It's kind of interesting because I've been talking to James about maybe trying to have a meeting to get some feedback from the Oregon wine industry to see, see, get their feedback. Because you know what I think is a problem might not be what they think is a problem. Um, I think we have to seriously look at water usage, seriously look at water usage um, for that. I think looking at how um, some of these hotter temperatures are affecting Pinot Noir. We're not as affected as sort of California where they're pushing very high sugars and things like that, but we do have a style of Pinot Noir. Does Oregon want to maintain that style? Or are they just going to embrace the fact that it's going to be different with climate change for that? Um, I know some of the work we did on the Fruity Project, we'd like to take back to wine processing. So I know how to get red fruit aroma from a chemical standpoint in a Pinot Noir, like strawberries, raspberries. I also know how to get dark fruit aroma, which is highly more complicated. I looked at James and it's like, so if we get the same lot of Pinot Noir, I'm pretty certain that we might be able to make a wine with processing that pushes red berry fruit aromas and one that pushes dark berry fruit aromas. And he looked at me and I'm like, okay, we can probably definitely do red berry fruit aromas. Less sure about the dark berry fruit aromas, but like, could we do a trial, trial for that? Um, so I'd like to take some of those levels of, I call it, it's very much what we're doing with smoke, this process flow chart of you're looking to achieve this quality. We know this is things that affect it. This is your starting material. Have yourself a path to do that. So I'd like to, instead of just having these relationships, I want to take it to the processing side of things for it. Like we're fairly close. The project that said it's really good, we just don't have funding for, would be very close to a predictive model for tropical fruit in white wines in general for it. Um, and that's a big thing for wine because we don't have a lot of predictive, like ways to predict quality or qualities, depending on how you put it, um, because it's so complicated for it. But that took like eight years of work to sort of get to this point where I'm like, I might have a predictive model for that. And you only have to measure like five things. <laughs> what about for your kind of own future? What else are you looking ahead to either, uh, either in, in, in the job or else, elsewhere? What else is in, on your horizon? It's, it's, I've, I've had some different, this is where it's always tricky. So I love the research that I'm doing. Love the research that I'm doing. Teaching this year was interesting because I overextended this year. Um, and we're getting help. Literally this morning, I had a research faculty assistant. She, she accepted the job because I need help on a managing style of things, purely from a time. You have to, I talk to people, you think about it. What's the thing I can, only I can do and other people can't? I'm supposed to be bringing money in, training students. Um, there's a level of, I don't need to order things for the lab. That's not the best use of my skill for that. Um, so this year was particularly hard. So I didn't really enjoy teaching this year. 
for that. Um, I think I've reached a point now, um, literally dropped off my dossier for full professor. Um, so we'll hear about that next year for it. But every now and then they keep putting me in leadership courses. And I don't know if I should take the hint about that or not, because I don't particularly want to go an administrative route, but it pops up every now and then. And I've also reached a point, because I've had conversations with other people where it's like, okay, so you've reached this. What do you want to do? Mm -hmm. And it's just like, well, I like the research that I'm doing. And so I keep getting prodded for things. But for me, I actually like 80% like my job, which is fairly high compared to a lot of people. I remember saying that to someone, they're like, really? It's like, yeah. And they're like, what's the 20%? And it's like administration essentially. Uh, and I'm like, and that doesn't go away. That's everywhere. It doesn't matter if you're an industry or at a university. They drive you bonkers. It's just part of that. But for the most part, I really like my job. Um, I have a very, a very supportive um, boss here. I've, I've been lucky. I've only ever had like one or two problematic students. I have really great students for it. But I got a little burnt out this year. So I'm hoping next year will be a little more fun for it. I am trying to separate the work and life much better. I used to be really good at it. And then COVID down that. But um, yeah, I'm trying not to overextend myself. But it is sort of like, OK, what do you want to do now? Because it's like I could continue kicking butt for research and see if I can get someone else to teach my class. That's a different negotiation I have to do. <laughs> I just want to break one year. It doesn't have to be permanently. <laughs> it's always when grants are due. Winter term grants are due. Unified happens. Organism Wine Symposium happens. It's not like a great term. Yeah, but I'm in an interesting, like, there are a couple of different opportunities opening up for different things for it. So I have to, I'm lucky I can be a little picky. Let's put it that way. Um, but I did have some serious conversations because people are like, have you ever thought about this? And it's like, I had to seriously think if I wanted to do the headache that administration is um, for it. And that's one thing where at least how OSU does it, I don't think I want to do that. It is not worth the blood pressure. Uh, but I'm, I'm getting, trying to get back to having a little bit more balance with life um, for that and, and enjoying those off hours instead of just being tired for it and focusing a little bit more on health and getting out there. Someone gave me a hard time. They're like, you were just walking around. And it was like, yeah, I took a 15 minute break to go for a walk. I sit down a lot. <laughs> What's the problem? <laughs> it was nice out. There was sun. <laughs> you guys know it's not always sunny. <laughs> um, so yeah, so it's, it's sort of an interesting transition time, but I know sort of, I like what I'm doing. As I said, we have great industry support and things like that, but it's it's kind of nice to be open to, I am open to a bit of change. It's like, well, it has to be the right kind of change though. If anyone wants, needs to have a wine program on a tropical island, I'm available for a short amount of time on sabbatical, like at a beach, I can do that for you. <laughs> I have sabbatical saved up, we can do this. Belize wine industry comes out of nowhere, right? Apparently, um, what, Bruno, Bruno Corno started on, the oh, Easter Islands or yeah, something like yeah. that, there was a winery. I was like, yeah. did they have a problem? I could go help. <laughs> so. Um, There's wine everywhere. Exactly. So, yeah. So all the questions that I have cool. for you, uh, anything I didn't ask that I should have, anything that we didn't cover? I don't cover? think so. Mm, we, I feel like I got through like everything to this point. Perfect. Primarily. Well, thank you so much for oh, well, your time. Well, thank you for and, coming. If, thanks for sharing your story with us and for taking us through the harrowing food science and uh, product safety things that I don't want to think about. Uh, I do have stories where people, because it's just people make comments sometimes, like regular consumers, and it's just because they don't know, but it's just like, you should not be worrying about that. <laughs> <laughs> like, that is not what I would be worrying about. <laughs> I'm going to shake, shake this all off. Yeah. Right. Well, You'll be you. fine. Thank you so much. 99% of the stuff out there is fine, guys. <laughs> Wash your fruits and vegetables. You'll be fine. That's right. Um, I'll go ahead and let you off the hook. Yes. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, guys.